legs are shorter than me. Do you want this chair? Can you see over me? Can you see over me? The anatomy of the airway. You can use this picture to define um, terms you may hear. Upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract. Uh, basically, to give you an overview, upper, you start with the nose. You can breathe through your mouth, but we don't teach the mouth as part of the airway. We breathe through the nose. So, we call it, uh, well, let's just start with nasal cavities. I'll put you out the details later, but uh, nasal cavities. To your throat or pharynx. Pharynx leads to the larynx, your voice box. Okay. Pharynx. Larynx. Which is continuous with you go through this airway in the larynx called the glottis. And pretty much most anatomists consider the larynx the border between upper and lower respiratory tract. So after you go through the glottis, then lower respiratory tract <clears throat> you have one trachea that's your windpipe the main one and we'll, we'll go through what's called the bronchial tree it branches like on an order of 23 or 24 times again it's one large airway it's probably the diameter that can uh, accommodate one finger okay about two and a half centimeters. Um, but anyways, it branches and branches. And the larger airways are called uh, the bronchi. Bronchi is plural, bronchus, singular. These are um, the larger airways that conduct air. They're called the conducting airways. seen the word conducting with airways or zone. It's the larger airways that are just transporting the air, but there, there's no gas exchange. The goal is just to transport, okay, conduct. And so the, um, the smallest airways are called the bronchioles. The major structural difference is bronchi are stiff airways that remain open. And there's cartilage, hyaline cartilage. I'll just put cartilage. That keeps the airways open, especially around the trachea. You can even see the C-shaped cartilage rings around the trachea. So as you suck air in and out, it doesn't collapse. It's a stiff tube that stays open. And you can even see the first division between the lung tissue. Then the airways disappear inside the lung tissue. You're having many branchings and they get smaller and smaller, but we call them the conducting airways when they have cartilage. And the smaller airways, called bronchioles, have no cartilage. But they have an increasing amount of smooth muscle. No cartilage. But you have increase, I'll put increase, up arrow, smooth muscle. It's at the bronchial level that you can kind of um, constrict or dilate the airways to increase or decrease airflow. So anyways, larger airways, conducting airways, they get smaller to the bronchioles. The end of the conducting airways are bronchioles. We literally call them terminal bronchioles. Now, terminal doesn't mean the end of the airway system. It's just the end of the conducting airways. So terminal bronchioles is the end of the conducting airways. Let me continue up here.
I'll say zone. Center of airway, same, same thing. So after that, you have what are called respiratory bronchioles. And that is the structure that is the beginning of what's called the respiratory zone. structure where you can have gas exchange. All the structures contain alveolar sacs or alveoli. Structures contain <coughs> alveoli. The alveoli is, are the structures in which you can have gas exchange across that respiratory membrane. Other structures that come after respiratory bronchioles, I'll just list them, we'll look at pictures later. They include alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs. <coughs> alveolar sacs, um, they have many of those individual alveolar spaces. Those, those spaces are the dead end. Okay, well, that's just what's the term. You can't see it. All you can see is the trachea and the lung tissue. But the smaller airways, the alveoles, the alveolar ducts, the alveolar uh, spaces are microscopic. So we'll just start at the beginning. And we'll start with like the nose and pharynx and punch out all the details. The goal is to teach you all the anatomy from nose to deep inside the lungs. The only time we really breathe through our mouth is when we're congested. And it dries your mouth out, it's very uncomfortable. I mean, the mouth isn't really supposed to be where you breathe. And they do use it for innovation and to put an airway in sometimes uh, for patients. But um, in terms of anatomy, you start with the nose. Call, let's call it anterior nares. The nostrils of your nose. Nares is nose. You got the hair follicles in your nose to help catch dust and debris in the air you breathe with hair. Okay, so you get into the actual nasal cavity shown here, and you have the nasal conchi. These structures in the ethmoid bone that um, create little spaces for air to flow through, to slow the air flow, to break it up into little eddies of air current. nasal cavities with conchi, C O N. And then to get out of the nasal cavities into the pharynx, you go through, uh, well, which basically you call it posterior nares. That'll lead to the pharynx. And it's color coded, so I don't have to color it in. The pharynx is the throat, and it basically has three regions. The region posterior to the nasal cavities, nasal pharynx. The region posterior to the oral cavity is the oral pharynx. And inferior to that, color green, it's kind of like a fork of the road. It's the laryngopharynx, where we have a, um, a, a place to route food posteriorly to the esophagus or route air uh, through the larynx. <laughs> well, 
I'll just list them as three regions of the pharynx you should be able to identify. Now, there's some more anatomy here. And uh, so I put a, a picture. We have half-end models. You study those for blood vessels. In terms of respiratory, uh, one thing you ought to notice I think is interesting is the mouth. Look at the tongue. The oral cavity is a little sliver. You see the back of your throat. That's why the doctor needs a big tongue depressor, right? So anyways, uh, the nasal pharynx, this is an opening to the auditory tube. is a tube that leads to your inner ear structure, your, uh, well, your tympanic cavity. And if you've forgotten that, if you have the ear lecture, go back and look at auditory tube. Because, and that's why you need a ear, nose, throat specialist, because it's all connected. If you have a connection, that, that's a pathway for infection to spread. So this is the throat, but that leads to the middle ear, and of course you can see how it's connected to the nose. So that's important. The opening of the auditory tube is contained there. Also, you have lymph tissue. This right there is a pharyngeal tonsil. Pharyngeal tonsil. Let me call it, it might be hard to see where I'm pointing. Let me, I'm pointing right there. Do you mind pointing to the auditory tube again, please? Yeah. So the auditory tube, the opening of the auditory tube is right there. This is the structure right there. I'm going to open it. Thank you. That was the opening of the auditory tube. This one right here, purple. There's tonsils I want you to know. This tonsil up here is the pharyngeal tonsil. Tonsils are the lymph tissue. this little arch of tissue, like when you look at the back of someone's mouth, you see that arch. It's a double fold there. They call that the fossies. Like that on the board. Well, anyways, the fossies, spelled like that, F-A-U-C-E-S, contains the palatine tonsil. Those are usually the adenoids that are removed in um, tonsillectomy. So if you look inside there, there's a little mass of tissue right in there. Yeah, I'm going to call them all green. Um, a third tonsil is called the lingual tonsil. Lingual means what in anatomy? Tongue. Tongue. Very good. Right here. Approximately know where to look for it on the bottom. So, anyways, let's review. That's the opening to your uh, auditory tube, pharyngeal tonsil, in the fossies, palatine tonsil, and behind the tongue, uh, lingual tonsil, lymphoid tissues that you should be able to identify on the model. I'm going to move on. I've never done this dissection, but we're in the neck now because we're talking about the throat. Now think about the neck as being a posterior part and an anterior part. Posterior neck, anterior neck. Posterior neck are your cervical vertebra. Anterior neck is like your airway right there. And you got your throat right there. 
if wherever I'm pointing there's a little ligament, you could just separate that and you could pull the skull head and front of the neck off of the vertebral column. That'll expose the pharynx and you can just cut through that. So this dissection is a view of the throat cut open. So that way, you're looking right, pretend your eyeball's behind you, you're looking right in because you've cut through all this and the vertebral column has been removed. <clears throat> uh, you guys go to open lab? Yes. Jeff has done that. He's done this one. He talked to him about it. Anyways, for you to see. Here are your conchi. Within the um, nasal cavities, notice I said cavities because you got two of them that are separated by the septum. Air goes through there. Now you're in the throat, which has been cut open, but you can see the root of the tongue. You can see the uvula. In there would be the palatine tonsils, okay, although they're not labeled on this figure. But this is the entryway into the larynx, so they call it laryngeal exit. And you have all these little bumps. But this is basically the larynx, your voice box, and it's the entryway into the airway. Okay. The larynx is a cartilaginous structure. So to give students a sense of that, if you go deep to this mucous membrane, you have cartilage. That's what it looks like without the mucous membrane on it, off of it. Okay. So this is just the bare cartilage. That's usually what you have to, we have to study. If you look over there, there's all these larynx models, right? So be prepared to study that. Um, so now we're talking about larynx. So we go from pharynx to larynx. They sound like structures in Egypt. Pharynx, larynx, not quite get, got the names. Anyways, let's get away from this picture and uh, continue on. We have a model that's pretty good at showing you, they kind of halfway have the membrane on, the more it's all like bluish, that's like just the cartilage, you took the membrane off. Um, you should be able to identify these two bumps because they're created by cartilages that are deep. So let's note first the cuneiform tubercle. and the corniculate tubercle. Now, tubercle means bumps. So these little bumps are difficult. Well, they're not difficult to see. They're just very hard to look for. See that little bump right there? Let me call it. Uh, See this bump there, and this bump there, where I colored it purple. That bump is the cuneiform. And uh, I wanted you to see how there's like a little, there's a horn, a right? little horn-shaped cartilage is right here. It's right here. I'm going to color it green. Corniculate means horn. But it creates that little bump. So that bump right there, or right there, is the corniculum one. So two little bumps to look for, okay? Uh, they're on your study guide. Also, posteriorly, we could see, well, let me, let me use other pictures to teach you all. We'll continue on in a second. For this one, I put this slide in just to point out the two little bumps. Corniculate, cuneiform, tubercles. Associate those with the larynx. Be able to identify those. So here's a side view of that model that's in the room. It's over there. Okay, let, let, me, let me show you. Should you study this in the lab? It comes off uh, top part, tongue and jaw. Uh, this is it. Right? I took pictures of it. These are pictures that I took. Uh, 
trach is about the width of your thumb or width of your finger there, okay? That's, that's about what it can accommodate your airway. So this is a good figure to study in the lab. Move on. So what I did here was I took this picture and I tilted it, and that's the angle it, it is in the neck. So the larynx by itself is at a little bit of an angle. That's the hyoid bone. I'm not really going to teach that. It's part of the uh, axial skeleton. <coughs> but it's, um, you have the larynx just inferior to it. So if you were to disassemble the, the cartilage, we usually teach the, the laryngeal cartilages of the larynx. Study the thyroid cartilage. A landmark surface feature of the thyroid cartilage. Well, first of all, thyroid should sound familiar. Thyroid gland is just inferior to it. The name thyroid comes from this cartilage, which means shield shaped, like a big shield. Okay. And that little bump. Well, anyway, I won't do it here. A little bump there is the laryngeal prominence. Study that. Adam's apple in males. Uh, males usually have deeper voices because I think um, the testosterone enlarges and thickens this cartilage, giving us deeper voices. That's when you go through puberty, your voice changes. Or, um, you know, I always give the example of female bodybuilders that have men-like voices because they probably use the uh, anabolic steroids that probably deepens their voice. Okay. Um, then you have cricoid cartilage. It's a singular cartilage shaped like a ring. Cricoid means ring. You know, like a, like a guy's class ring, you got a big face here, and that's the band of a class ring. So it's kind of like a backwards class ring here. Okay. All right, superior view, posterior view of the larynx. Superiorly, let's look at that one first. Here's my big old thyroid cartilage. Inside, I see these ligaments. Those are your vocal cords or vocal ligament. So in the thyroid cartilage, look for vocal ligaments. Notice how the vocal ligaments attach to the inside of thyroid. Then they go in posteriorly and they each attach to a separate arytenoid cartilage. Here's the arytenoid cartilage from the posterior view. Um, Let me, let's note those. So, cricoid check, um, thyroid check, cricoid check, and paired arytenoid cartilages. Because there's two of them. And if you look at the posterior view, you can see at the tip of each arytenoid cartilages, you have paired corniculate cartilages. on the posterior view are showing that you have pivot points. The arytenoid cartilages can pivot to move the vocal cords um, together and apart. When they're apart, that's a very important. That space, that aperture, is called the glottis. It's where air goes in. If that space is occluded by, say, food, you're, you're going to choke. It's a very important space. The glottis is the space between vocal ligaments. The sound of choking is silence. You shouldn't hear anything. Hopefully you can see them that they're choking. 
if they're coughing, let them cough. That'll, the pressure of the cough will get it out. Um, I remember I was at a restaurant, a guy was eating a burrito and he choked on a shrimp. And he, he, I heard this weird sound, it's like <gasps> And he finally coughed it out. I didn't know what he was doing. He almost choked. But that air getting through was enough to let him breathe in and get it out. But if you can't get any air in, you're, gonna, you're choking. Okay. So the sound of choking is no sound. So anyway, that's the space. That's the glottis. You see this V? When you intubate, when paramedic students practice intubating, um, they use their equipment. Um, I've seen them do it a lot. They look for this. They look for this V so they can put the, um, their tube down there. Okay, it's a very important thing for uh, any, any paramedics. Anyone ever intubate? I'm just curious. I don't want to. Have you intubated? I've intubated. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, like. You want to talk about um, what you do to. Well, more than anything, airline. it was more like trachea. trachea oh, you go through the trachea? Yeah. Okay, you didn't go through the oral cavity? No. Oh, okay, I no. understand. No. Yeah, that's another way you could do it. What do you call that procedure? The, the trachea one? Yeah. So what you're doing is you make an incision right there. And tracheotomy? Yeah. Yeah, uh, tracheotomy. Or you cut right here. I forget the name of this ligament between thyroid and cricoid. So you feel Adam's apple. You can go just inferior to that. You can make an incision there and put the tube right down there. If you go through the mouth, you have to like be behind the subject. Their head's right there. And then you kind of look for that. Well, anyways, we're getting a little clinical here. This is just an anatomy class. You need to get into the right program to get proper training. All right, well, anyways, this is the epiglottis. That's also important. Let's note that. The word epiglottis means over the glottis. So this guards the airway during swallowing. So imagine this, when you swallow, it covers the glottis, so food is routed down, um, not the airway, but the food way. I once was speaking to a paramedic who said the most difficult thing he had removing from the airway was peanut butter. You could choke on peanut butter. This small child, got crazy with the peanut butter. And it's like, what, really, peanut butter? I guess, how are you gonna get, yeah, it's, it's not a single object that can just pop out ludge it back there and block the airway. Okay, here's another view. So this is the sagittal section we looked at earlier. So this is the larynx sagittal section, and it's a good picture to look at because you can visualize these two ligaments right there. The superior ligament is the vestibular ligament. The inferior ligament, that's our vocal cord. That's the vocal ligament that produces sound. So, um, before I erase the word larynx, one of the main functions is it, um, I'm just going voice production. The other main function guards airway during swallow. If you want to like, what's the larynx for? Those two things. Voice production, guard the airway during swallow. Now that's just the ligament. You dissect it off, the membrane that covers it. With membrane over it, sometimes we refer to it as the false vocal cord. Or sometimes when you put kind of membrane over structure, they call it fold. 
Sometimes this is also referred to as the vestibular fold when there's the membrane on it. Call it anything if you're filling in a blank. You'll, you'll get it right. But I just want to give you all the terms that you're going to come across when you read. Now, so the inferior one, vocal ligament. I'm just going to go through all the alternate names. Those are the true vocal cords. Also called the vocal fold. So take your pick, they'll mean the same thing. Just know that the vocal ligament, obviously, by its name, produces sound. And I wanted you to see it attaches to the thyroid cartilage, but if you isolate the, the arytenoid cartilage, because the vocal ligament is attached to that, that's what it looks like by itself. And there's the little horn tip, the corniculate cartilage on top. You just gotta remember, vestibular ligament, vocal ligament, okay? If you, um, this is kind of an illustrated view of a laryngoscope. Okay. Uh, if you want to get a view of the glottis, the whitish structures, and there really are whitish, are the vocal ligaments or vocal cords. Okay. And so I kind of oriented this picture to match this picture. And I even drew a line for a reference point. Remember these two bumps? Cuneiform, caniculate cartilage to kind of like give myself a reference point to line it up. All right, well, anyways, uh, we have a model. And this model here is. It's this one. What I did was I just kind of put it together and I just kind of put my camera in so I could kind of see that. The vocal ligaments, the space between them is the epiglottis. I'm sorry, the epiglottis is there. The space between them is the glottis. Okay. Well, label, one function of the uh, vestibular fold, it kind of helps guard the airway. It's like a shelf over the vocal cord and the glottis. I don't know if it really guards it, but the way I think of it is, if food, like a little coffee bean or something, falls down there, and it falls on the shelf, the way it is, it, because it's a fold, it'll kind of like fall to the side. Maybe you could cough it out. It's not it favors just falling to the side, not falling into your airway. That's why I say it kind of helps guard you. When you speak, you close the glottis and air whistles through the slit, producing uh, voice sounds. When you look at this model, I took this picture, I just kind of like, I just went like that and just put it like that. Uh, I got two structures here, 27, 28. The top one is 27, so what structure is that? <coughs> top one is? Yeah, the vestibular one. It's kind of like a little shelf there, then you have this widest structure, 28. That's the vocal cord right there. So, once again, on the picture, uh, vestibular fold, vocal fold. Or model, vestibular fold, vocal fold. So here's an actual do a biological picture. Um, inhalation, and this is when you speak. So speaking is actually the intermittent release of um, intermittent release of exhaled air. It involves the opening and closing of the glottis. Upon inhalation, air rushes in. Okay. And upon exhalation, the vocal cords close, and air is forced to whistle through a slit, vibrating the vocal cords, producing sound. Go ahead and try to talk while breathing in. What's it going to sound like? It's not like that. Always do it. Always try it. It never works. You can't talk. You can never talk. This is funny. That's, that's why you don't do it. And that's why, like, if you like, do the helium balloon, which has a, well, it's vibrating the vocal cords at a higher frequency. That's why you have that high volume voice. Okay. Now, pitch of your voice is determined by the length and tension of the vocal cords. The loudness depends upon, you know, if you're just screaming, the force at which air rushes past it. And of course, your pharynx, nasal cavities, they resonate, amplify, and have sound quality. And, um, you know, your voice as you talk, it always sounds better because your ear is right there. 
So if you hear your voice on tape, that's me. It's not terrible. Uh -huh. yeah, I've had that experience. I watch myself on YouTube. That's why when you're stuffed up, you can't talk, right? Well, sound is shaped by the action of soft palate, lungs, and um, well, where I'm going with this is there's a couple of muscles I want you to know. There's a lot of laryngeal muscles. I'll just give you two to know: one on the front, one on the back. Because you know they can help move the vocal cords, tense the vocal cords, and contribute to that. One of the front is cricket thyroid. Notice it has like a couple of heads. Don't worry about identifying the different parts. Just call the whole thing cricket thyroid. The one on the back is posterior cricoid retinoid. Let's go through the details of what I want you to know for these muscles. The nervous innervation for cricothyroid thyroid is a nerve, well, they're all branches of agus, but the branch I want you to know is the superior or laryngeal nerve. What's the external branch? Let's just go with superior laryngeal nerve. That's the innervation. On one side, <clears throat> on the left side, there's a recurrent branch that wraps under the aortic arch and then wraps back up. Um, that's of clinical significance. If a patient presents with a hoarse voice, it may indicate the aortic aneurysm right here. Because if the aneurysm is in this location, it will pinch that nerve, giving you a hoarse voice, because these kind of go into the larynx. Uh, all right, well, anyways. Here's the action. We have a model. It's a functional model. It's over there. It's a screw that allows the um, pivot of this muscle. Because the action of this muscle, you pivot this forward, it tenses the vocal cords for higher pitch in your voice. If you want to experience, I mean, not to embarrass myself again, you go, <laughs> and you can feel things when they're moving, right? It's kind of this thing going on. So that's what we're talking about. You tantalize vocal cords, it affects the pitch or sound of your voice. So here's the posterior cricoarytenoid, innervated by inferior laryngeal nerve, part of the recurrent laryngeal nerve I just mentioned. They say recurrent because it goes under and it recurves, it goes back. Uh, posterior cricoretinoid innervated by inferior. So the muscles are, there's many different reasons why you name a muscle a muscle. These are named for the cartilages they attach to, right? Cricoid cartilage, thyroid cartilage, it's on the posterior aspect. Crico, um, cricoid cartilage, arytenoid cartilage. Let's remember that um, the arytenoids move the vocal cords. Turns out the action of this muscle is to abduct vocal cords. So I included this one. In our functional model, that's me pulling, pulling that uh, string there. It mimics the action of posterior cricoarytenoid open the glottis, abduct vocal cords. That allows you to breathe in. If you paralyze this muscle, can't breathe in. So that's pretty important. Uh, okay, there you go. 
And uh, before you ask me where are these on the model, there they are. There's the model. You can see those nerves are shown on that model in the room. Another thing about um, the glottis, maybe you haven't thought about it, but we do it on a daily basis. Let's just name it. It's called Valsalva's maneuver, where you um, strain against a closed glottis. <laughs> When you strain against a closed glottis, it's that grunting noise you make when you lift a heavy object. You would do it instinctively, and what you're doing is you're trapping air down there. You make your trunk into a splint. It, it increases the uh, intra-abdominal pressure. That's kind of that's what you do when you you know strain to go number two. You know on the toilet. <laughs> you're straining. You're, physiologically, you're doing Valsalva's maneuver. Okay, to help empty your rectum, so to speak. And, well, you know, like I said, you do it when you lift heavy loads. And what also increases um, blood flow to the head, I remember uh, I took a human performance class and they were teaching us how fighter pilots, when they train, they put them through this thing called the vomit comet, which finally spins you around. You've seen it in movies, like astronaut movies, like First Man. Well, anyways, I don't know if you know it's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. You'll be hearing a lot of that stuff. But anyways, for that, um, to... When you subject the body to these massive G-forces, for example, when you tip the fighter jet down, and there's a force down, but then your heart has to pump blood up to your head. And the problem um, fighter pilots have, they lose consciousness because of the G-forces, which is a problem when you're flying a jet. They black out. And um, they have these guys in the flight simulators, and you can see them black out. And they don't even know they blacked out, okay? It's pretty remarkable. So what they do is, to prevent blackout, well, they wear their, their, their G-suits, uh, their flight suits that um, have these bladders of air that help maintain pressure. But they also have them do Valsalva's maneuver. They build the musculature here, and they just have them go, <coughs> and they don't pass out, okay? It increases blood flow to the head. And, well, anyways, that's the only real like physiology thing I, I, I've seen Valsalva's maneuver used for, for uh, for pilots. But you know, you can also use it to equalize middle ear pressure. Make your ears pop. Alright, so I'm gonna move on from larynx and Valsalva's maneuver to trachea. So know about that. The trachea, it's not very long. I, so I got this picture here. I, I can feel my Adam's apple. Right? And so that's my larynx. So just below that is my trachea. And it ends right behind my sternum. So like, you know, four inches? It's not very long. From there to there, it's not very long. Well, when you do a section through the trachea, as well as the esophagus, what we learned from this picture is the tracheal wall is very thick. It's organized into a mucosa, a submucosa, and adventitia. So let's call this tracheal wall. Mucosa, submucosa, adventitia. And let's talk about what you should be able to identify in each of these layers. So in, in our trachea slide, this is a low magnification. And from here to here, well basically just all that on top is mucosa. Here to here, is all submucosa. And everything deep to that, this big cartilage ring and all this tissue out there, that's the adventitia. So higher mag, again, here is the mucosa. Let's talk about that. 
higher mag. Here's the mucosa. We define that as a ciliated pseudostratified columnar ET with cobblestones. Let's write that down. We could go with ET for short for epithelial tissue. Oh, I forgot columnar. Sorry. So we've got five columnar. with goblet cells. Now it's a big long term and it describes this epithelium well and it points out an important function for a conducting zone type of structure. First of all, it's cilia. Lots of cilia. The cilia is good for catching debris, air particulates. Breathing a lot of bad things. I got a mold problem in my garage. I, I, I'm calling the professionals. I'm not going to try to do it myself. Okay. You can inhale a lot of bad stuff. Regular dust, sil the cilia is good for catching it. It's, this is a mucous membrane, and this contributes to the mucus. It's a pretty mucus. Imagine a thick layer of mucus on top of that epithelium, and it's moving one way up and out. They literally call it mucus escalator. That's important for a productive cough. A productive cough is you cough the phlegm out. Okay. For example, if you have smoker's cough, the, the cigarette smoke, it eliminates this function because you lose the cilia. And so it, it may be more frustrating to get the, uh, the things out when you lose the uh, escalator function. Well, the good news is if you're able to quit, uh, epithelial tissue is highly regenerative. So you'll get it back. Anyways, epithelium is important. This big, thick, columnar epithelium. Now right below it is a lamina propria, like a basement membrane. Functions like, I'm just going to go with BM, basement membrane, BM, right here. OK, so that's our mucosa. We pull back. Our submucosa is basically a loose CT. There's all these glands in it. So if I go back to high, all of these cuboidal cells are glandular in their function. But let's call them seromucous glands, submucosa. Seromucous. So let's go from this picture to this picture. Um, now, each of these glands has a duct that goes to the surface. And when I saw this, I mean, I got really excited. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd, so when I see this kind of thing, I get excited. It's very rare to see this. What you got to do is you got to cut that gland right in the middle so you can see the duct empty to the surface. So all this mucus is being secreted and squirted out of the surface there for the mucus escalator function. So zero mucus gland. Uh, let's see. Okay, I wanted to take a close-up picture of this. This is like the inside. If you were to stand inside this gland and look around, this is like the apical view. You're looking around inside the gland if you're standing right there inside. Okay, but anyways, that's just a high mag of. Zero mucus gland, that's what you got to know. To keep on moving on, to, um, I'm going back and forth between these images. If you go back to this medium magnification, for the adventition, the only thing I would have you identify is this big, stiff cartilage ring. Okay. If we go back to our low magnification, see, see how you're cutting through individual rings here? Okay, so that's just one ring. 
and the tissue type is hyaline carbonate. So for adventitia, Here's the mucus escalator function. I put a couple of pictures there, but really what you ought to do is you know, YouTube mucus escalator. You'll see it's, it's really an organized, uh, interesting thing to look at. The cilia beat one way, and the mucus just kind of moves it right out. Okay. You know, this is a good place to stop, and we'll put it up here next time. And I'm going to transition into lap. Give me a couple few minutes to get set up, and. Go ahead and take a stretch break and let me give you instructions in about five minutes. <laughs>